as we've already discussed on the show, the crisis in Nicolas Maduro's Venezuela is getting worse by the day, and the popular socialist project launched by his predecessor, Hugo Chavez, is being criticized by Venezuelans and Venezuelan protesters like never before. But is the Maduro government willing to listen to that criticism, or is it getting more and more authoritarian by the day? To debate this, I'm joined by Ava Gollinger, a Venezuelan-American journalist and a former advisor to Hugo Chavez, and Professor Gabriel Hetland from the University of Albany, who's writing a book about democracy in Latin America. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Uh, Gabriel, you were generally uh, sympathetic towards the Chavista project, but you've recently written that while previous claims of Venezuela's authoritarianism have had little merit, this is no longer the case. What's changed, Gabriel? What makes you now think that President Maduro is on a path towards authoritarian rule? Yeah, um, I think it's an important question. And I wouldn't say that they're on a full-scale path to authoritarian rule or that they are authoritarian. Um, I, I think it's important to say Nicolas Maduro was democratically elected, just as Hugo Chavez was. It is a government under siege from the right and from the U.S. government. But I think um, actions over the last 16 months have moved Venezuela, unfortunately, in a more authoritarian direction. The key thing, I think, is suspending regional and municipal elections last year, which were scheduled to happen by the end of 2016. I think that that happened with no justification whatsoever, and there was no um, explanation for why that happened. So I think that's the single most um, disturbing thing okay. that's happened. Ava, would you agree with Gabriel that Venezuela is now moving in a pretty authoritarian direction? Well, I don't think I would phrase it that way whatsoever. I think what's important to recognize are some of the things he did point out, precisely the fact that it is a government under siege, that, you know, you have a situation where you have violent anti-government protests in the streets. And we're not just talking about, you know, your average type of protest. We're talking about the use of Molotov cocktails, using them against security forces, attacking directly security forces, you know, using weapons, guns, and an ongoing uh, destabilization effort on the part of the Venezuelan opposition. I mean, there's a lot of issues going on. There's a complete lack of trust in the government, in state institutions, and in the opposition, and in most of the political parties in the country. Just sticking with this idea of authoritarianism, and, and, and you're pushing back against that, obviously both sides will argue about who's to blame for the deaths of protesters, they would say security forces being heavy-handed. You're pointing out that there's violence on the part of the protesters. But what's indisputable is that the government is using military courts to try civilian protesters, uh, that opposition figures are behind bars, that the president says he wants to change the constitution in order to, quote, restore the peace. How is that not creeping authoritarianism? Well, first of all, the initiative underway right now of convening a constitutional assembly to redraft the Constitution. I can't necessarily say that I agree with that as the path forward, but I do believe that the Maduro government is looking for a way out of the situation that it's in. And there, the president is not just going to resign because there's opposition against him. Obviously, you know, that suspension of elections has caused a lot of the unrest in the country now. And I don't particularly see a justification for having suspended those elections. I think that that's important. The country the country needs to move, move forward in a democratic framework. And what's happening now is we're sort of seeing both sides going beyond that. Mm. The opposition doesn't play by democratic rules, unfortunately has not. And as of yet, we haven't seen any such initiative or indication that they will in the near future. Although they would say they won parliamentary elections, just as you say Maduro has won a presidential election. Just to be clear, do you support the use of military courts against non-military people? Well, first of all, I don't have the full evidence of exactly who is being held in military courts or in military prisons and being tried in military courts. At the same time, imagine in the United States if we had anti-government protesters using violent methods to try to overthrow the government. Uh, certainly in this country, they would not just be in prison. If we're talking about resulting in death and injury of innocent people, uh, those But no one would agree with military could... courts against non-military personnel. Amnesty International well, that's saying, not necessarily... Well, Amnesty I mean, International I would like... are saying that they're not military people, the people who have been locked. A lot, lot of them have just been rounded up yes, for other crimes. Yes, they could be considered... In the U.S., you can consider terrorists enemy combatants. Exactly. I'm not saying and, and, and that that is a justification. It sounds like But the yeah. Venezuelan government is saying that those people rising up and using violence to try to overthrow the government, they are calling okay. them terrorists and therefore justifying the 
detention and the use of military courts. I'm not saying okay. I'm a human rights lawyer. I'm an attorney before being a journalist. So I certainly don't necessarily agree with the use of military tribunals if to try civilians. Okay, Gabriel, you've said that you do think there are signs of authoritarianism, there are merits to that charge. When does authoritarianism uh, become dictatorship? The head of the Organization of American States, for example, Luis Almagro, says he's a dictator. Others have accused him of that as well. You obviously don't think he's a dictator. But at what point do you, would you, as a, as a kind of former friend turned mild critic, go from saying, this is not just authoritarianism, this is now into something else? Sure. I mean, I think there's certain questions we would ask about if it's a dictatorship. Um, first of all, do people have the right to protest? As of now, they do have the right to protest. There's certain restrictions. Some of them are reasonable. Some of them are probably are not. But those are similar to what governments throughout the world use. Um, there's also tremendous freedom of expression, some restrictions, again, some of those are justified, some of those are not. Um, there's restrictions on politicians. So if those things increase, if we saw no right to protest, then it would be harder to claim the government's not a dictatorship. If we saw no freedom of expression, it would be harder to do that. And in particular, if we saw a suspension of any and all electoral paths. So I really do think that the suspension of elections last year is a merit charge for calling the government and how much, Gabriel, more authoritarian. And how much of that responsibility for this current crisis and for the kind of authoritarianism that you've pointed to, how much, is that, how much of that is the fault of Hugo Chavez, the kind of uh, charismatic predecessor of Nicolas Maduro? Did he, I mean, he, we know that he uh, made huge social advances. His defenders, supporters would point to, you know, poverty relief, education, health care. Uh, but didn't he also, in many ways, lay the groundwork for today's issues, authoritarian rule, economic dysfunction? I would not say in terms of authoritarian rule. I mean, I think that the Venezuelan government under Hugo Chavez was imperfect, and there were certain times when they were subject to valid critiques. 2010, there was a National Assembly election that the opposition came pretty close to winning, and then when they took their seats a couple weeks before that, there was an enabling law that allowed Chavez to rule by decree for about 18 months. So I think that's subject to critique. But generally, I think Chavez ruled in a very, very democratic manner. He was repeatedly affirmed at the polls. However, I think on the economic front, some of the problems that we're seeing now, which can't be sort of easily disentangled from the political crisis, are the responsibility of Chavez. The dependency on oil, which is a big factor right now, got worse under Chavez. It's not to say that Chavez alone is to blame. This is a problem that goes back decades and decades, and all oil states around the world have a very difficult time mm. dealing with this. But well, Chavez deserves some blame for that and for allowing corruption to go relatively unaccounted uh, for. Ava, you worked with Hugo Chavez. How would you respond to that critique of him? Some I would agree with, but some I would disagree with. I know personally that Chavez's largest vision was to decrease the dependency on oil and to sort of revigorate some of Venezuela's other industries, such as the agricultural industry. One of his major objectives was to use Venezuelan natural resources beyond just oil, but also gas, minerals, to invest into national development in the country. Unfortunately, most of that never actually came to fruition because of internal corruption and just, you know, in incapacity to sort of fulfill uh, those initiatives once they began. Some of that responsibility, of course, Chavez was the president, so he can we can lay the blame on him. But there was also a team around him that took advantage of a lot of the things that made him the admirable leader that he was to millions of Venezuelans and others around the world. Gabriel, uh, Chavez, for all his faults, was democratically elected, was very popular. Uh, his vision was popular. That isn't the case now. 80% of voters say they want a change in government. Uh, people are fed up with the government, including former Chavez supporters. Yes, no, that's absolutely true, although it's really important to look at the reasons why people are fed up with the government. And this is a sort of reason why popular barrios, by and large, have not been joining the anti-Maduro protests, although they have engaged in somewhat sporadic uh, acts of looting and um, looking for food. So popular sort of sectors in Venezuela are very, very concerned about the economic crisis. They want to see a solution, and they're rightly blaming the Maduro administration and the opposition for failing to provide that. Okay. They are less critical about the so-called authoritarianism of the government, which, again, I think is somewhat justified, but not completely. Maybe because they're not on the receiving end of some of it. Um, uh, Ava, let me ask you this. Nicolas Maduro said, in 2018, come rain, thunder, or lightning in Venezuela, there will be presidents presidential elections. Were he to suspend, cancel, postpone those elections, would that be a red line for you? Would that be the moment you said, actually, this has gone too far, he is an authoritarian leader and abusing power? 
I don't think it's a question of a red line. I mean, I think that we have to look at circumstance, but there there needs to be elections in Venezuela. They need to comply with the Constitution. If they are embarking on a project to redraft a new Constitution, then it will definitely require a presidential election, just as happened when this Constitution was drafted and ratified by a majority of Venezuelans in 1999. So, and you, so you, you wouldn't defend under any circumstances a President Maduro decision to postpone the elections, whatever excuse he might offer? I'm not, first of all, I'm not defending the government of Venezuela. I, you know, I'm not defending President Maduro in any of his decisions. I'm someone who has spent and lived in Venezuela for over a decade. You know, I am Venezuelan. I did work as an advisor and was clo I was a close friend to Hugo Chavez. I know Maduro very well. Um, and worked alongside him, too, for many years. I know internally the situation in the country, and I know also what people within, you know, what has has been sort of the grassroots base of support in Chavismo feel today and are saying today there's a hardcore support um, for the revolution at any cost that wants to push through this crisis and come out never letting the opposition regain power. There are others who would like to see resolution, who don't want to give up the achievements that that were gained throughout the past, you know, 15, 17, 18 years. But at the same time, they don't want things to continue as they are, and they don't like um, Nicolas Maduro and the way that he's managed the government since Chavez passed away and he was elected. But at the same time, violent protests to overthrow a government and seeking external intervention, primarily from Washington, to execute a coup d'etat or some kind of regime change is completely unacceptable. That is not an alternative to the crisis Venezuela is facing today. Ava, Gabriel, thank you very much for joining me here in the arena. We're out of time. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.